So this is actually where you got the name from for the band. Yeah, we didn't name ourselves after the sculpture. We just liked the name. Is there any Seattle scene? This was the scene. We'd go and see the shows these that were put on by the U Men, and we'd go see these guys, and these guys would come see us. And everyone would go see these guys. Sometimes we would that open the for these guys, so it was right? like, oh, so we play, and then these guys would come out. It's not like it's a, this magical bottomless pit of great bands or anything. I mean, there's plenty of bad bands coming out of Seattle, too. There's so much media attention on it that, uh, they're expecting all this great stuff to keep flourishing from Seattle. And it's probably, you know, had its had its day. Yeah, I'm sure eventually, course. eventually, if you say you're a band from Seattle, people will be less likely to want to hear about yeah. you than, than more likely. It's trendy now, which is a really bad thing to be from Seattle, you know? Yeah, if you're, if you're going to be in fashion at one point, you're going to be out of fashion at another point. There was no, like, the, there was no pressure put on us by the label to do anything or write any particular kind of record um there were i mean we, we, both louder than love and bad motorfinger and even temple of the dog for that matter were all records made by us you know with no one you know trying to impress upon us any guidelines other than us we didn't come out with like a, a an incredibly commercial record and then then go out and tour with guns and roses you know we came out with with our record as it is, which isn't a commercial record, and tour with a band like that. And I think that people know, as long as you're doing what you want to do, that who you're playing in front of and who you're playing with isn't as important. And, and it, to us, I mean, considering how much we've toured and how long we've been a band, it was important to us to do something different and play in front of new people. We came out of like an urban scene that bands like, uh, Pearl Jam, Mudhoney, and the Melvins, and uh, Nirvana all came out of, which was sort of like this small town kind of urban club scene that was also just as much of a recording scene um, as anything. It wasn't a vibrant club scene. It was You could play shows here and there, but for the most part, we were bands that recorded and made demos and independent records. Is there a feeling about which bands would maybe break through first or not? Or and it would depend on who you're a fan of because um in spite of the in spite of the reputation of of like what it is all the bands have very different sounds you know they're very different bands there's there's certain similarities but really i mean if if you sat down someone who didn't know and played them um a nirvana record a mud hunting record and a soundgarden record and a pearl jam record they you know they would have no clue that they were all from like the same city or the same scene being nominated for Grammy, I, I don't think it's going to affect us in <laughs> the slightest bit. Yeah, I think the first sign you'll see of that is when we all start getting facial reconstructive surgery. Right. You know, when we come Great. out. Uh, well, you know, I don't feel I've changed at all. Went up uh, north of Seattle. Were you staying at the studio, and were you sort of, sort of isolated? No, we, we lived up in Seattle, so we we're staying at home Meeting. and then commuting. Yeah. Okay. Um, how's that with the arrangements then when you go in to record? I mean, are you pretty much got everything ready? Yeah, to go? we're rehearsing them. You're playing the whole songs in rehearsal. They're all ready to go live. I mean, Sometimes songs get rearranged in the studio. We usually write up to, or we write songs right up to the point that we record. And sometimes it'll be like something that just isn't washing, and all of a sudden we'll change it at the last minute, you know, and then record it, and it works. We're definitely playing it as a band before we're recording it. We always are looking for um, sort of capturing what we would sound like live on tape. You know, I think that's what most uh, most rock bands try for, and it's probably most rock bands' uh, biggest problem when it comes to recording the record. On your uh, first basis now, we asked, uh, why, why did Jason leave? <laughs> and the flavor is still lasting. <laughs> We, we asked Jason to leave because we didn't, um, we've been used to a situation where everyone in the band were, uh, friends, you know, before the band was started and, and, uh, everyone got along and everyone sort of could relate to each other on a, um, a friendly level and like a, you know, a natural level where you didn't really have to struggle to get along. And when Hero left, it was sort of difficult to try and find somebody that, uh, that, 
could not only be in your band as a player, but also be your friend and like actually get along with them as a person and a human being and relate to them, you know, and, you know, enough ways, you have enough things in common that you can be buddies in it. That's for us. It's not that easy to do, really. I mean, we're we don't have a lot of friends. We're fairly reclusive. We don't, um, you know, we're not social butterflies. And and with Jason, it just didn't. That just didn't click. And with Ben, you know, when when we asked Jason to leave, we didn't we didn't do a big casting call and and run people through auditions again. We we chose Ben sort of simultaneously. Kind of knew that Ben had no friends. Yeah. So you let him in the club. And I knew that every garden. Needs a bean pole. Look how skinny I am. You see how skinny I am? He's skinny. I'd like to not um, have any sexual impulses and not have to sleep. That'd be great. Because that would save like a lot of time and like um, it would save a lot of energy spent on things that that, that aren't Unique as important man. as other things. <laughs> yeah, like guarding a bridge. No, you know, like things I'd rather do, like like writing music and playing music and and hiding from the rest of the world. That would be fun. That would be fun. You think about sex a lot? <laughs> yeah, every, all the time. Every Enough day. to distract you. Which is really irritating. It's distracting. It also makes people like It'll totally, to totally comp compromise their judgment and do like really stupid things. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, it's a battle to not do that, not mm -hmm. let that happen. Isn't that sort of fun in a way as well? I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's flattering to be, um, be influential, but you know, it's like, it's, it's like if you go to the store and you buy a really nice dress and then you go to a party and some other bitch is wearing your dress. And <laughs> even though you might like her, maybe she was your old roommate or something, but it's still, you know, you wish you wouldn't wear it because you bought it first. <laughs> Here at Foundations Forum 91, I'm Ricky Rackman. This is the Headbangers Ball, and these guys are Soundgarden. That's a new bass player, Ben. And um, heard rumors, something that I'm crossing my fingers for. I hear about a possible tour with you guys and... Guns N' Roses. Yes. So this is happening. Seems to be. It's got to be pretty exciting for you. I mean, it's a pretty big band, and getting you guys out in front of even a bigger market. Definitely. I mean, yeah. now you guys started off with kind of an alternative bass, right? people that were listening to you and now it's crossing over into the rock and roll audience is that right that's that's true actually but even from early on i think we had um what you might call alternative hard rock fans you know mm -hmm. um we're certainly no mainstream band by any stretch you know we don't have a we, don't <laughs> we have, have had mainstream fans though mm -hmm. yeah that's true that's true but uh like a tour with like Guns N' Roses, it wouldn't really, it would be a good tour whether it was uh, arenas or not, just because you know you're dealing with a band that has a metal, uh, has a, a metal following, but isn't heavy metal, you know, and appeals to more than just like one genre of music. And there isn't really too many bands out there like that. We've always had sort of a problem um, with tour packages because we're not an easy band to like uh, put with another band. Now, I think you did a little bit of acting recently for this movie, uh, Singles. Aren't you in that movie? I did some cameos in it. It doesn't really involve much acting, you know. I just sort of, uh, I just sort of be myself. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So. Now, tell us a little bit about the video, which we're about to debut here. Well, we crucify meat <laughs> <laughs> and... Women and plants and <laughs> a salad, birds and rocks and things. We crucify a salad. Now, yes. That's drawing the line. I'm sorry. When you're it's innocent vegetables, I don't know. That, that's kind of a little no, bit too, no, too much. We knew we'd offend somebody. <laughs> you see, I was the one that you offended with the vegetables. <laughs> we're glorifying the vegetables by like putting them, you know, on the cross like a deity. You know, it's like a religion of vegetables now. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the brand new video from them. This is a debut. This is Jesus Christ Pose from Soundgarden. Don't be scared. Now, recently we caught up with Chris Cornell from Soundgarden to ask him about, you know, there's been a little bit of controversy about uh, the imagery in his new video, Jesus Christ Pose, and this is what he said. The whole idea behind the song initially was um, me personally being irritated by the exploitation of of the Christ Pose persecuted deity figure. You know, you see it in rock magazines and fashion magazines where you see rock stars and models like assuming that that pose and how it was kind of irritating and and uh basically i'm sort of exploiting it to show that it's irritating to exploit it in the video 
um, it's it's a it's probably one of the most widely seen images in in the Western world, and, and we just kind of uh, are making it a little bit more wider. So. Hmm. That was Chris Cornell from the band Soundgarden. Soundgarden is one of the bands that has a new album out, which is incidentally called Bad Motorfinger, which has also got a good street buzz. I was talking a little bit earlier when Nirvana was here. A lot of people are getting into Nirvana. A lot of people are really getting into the new Soundgarden album, and that's purely because it's very good. Welcome back to the Headbangers Ball. I'm here with Chris and Kim from the band Soundgarden. Welcome back to the show. And thank you. Guys, we're here a long, long time ago when I was just starting out, and then we talked to you at the... Uh, Concrete Foundations. Mm -hmm. And for those people that, that missed the show then, you guys have a new member of the band. Yeah, Ben Shepard, the bass player. And tell us a little bit about that and how that came about. For those that, that missed that show. We pretty much hired him because he was six foot three, six foot four. Yeah, no, you know, people, people don't harass us as much with that guy. So that, so that was, it was kind of the fear factor that you put him in. There. Yeah, he's, yeah. Kind of, he's, he's the type of person who would like kick your ass and then read you poetry afterwards. Now mm -hmm. he, he played on the new album, right? Yeah. He wrote on the new album, too. So did, did things seem a lot different having a new member contributing to a band? It always probably should, unless it's like a situation where you're just hire, hiring a guy just to do what you tell him to do. But we, we definitely wanted somebody to contribute because we've always been used to having like four members contributing musically to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're just used to it. We like it. It's, it's the way it should be. I like the record a lot. I've been listening to it a real lot. And it seems to me that a lot of maybe radio stations, a lot of people have been playing the song Outshined a lot. Yeah, it seems like they have. Is it possible that that's going to be a new single and video? Um, we're going to do a video for that uh, today. Oh, really? Yeah. Any, give us some like kind of hints, because I know we're going to have it on the Headbangers Ball. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it's going to be like before we see it. Yeah, the, all I can really say is that I have no idea. Because <laughs> you don't have, do you have specific as I can get. You don't go into it with a certain idea of how you want to do it. Yeah, we always do, and then it never comes out that way. <laughs> so you know, we'll come ask, back and let you know. That's a question. This might be a dumb question, but it wouldn't be the first time I asked one. Slaves and Bulldozers mm -hmm. is my favorite song on the record. And um, are you doing all the vocals on that? Because there's one part where, if it is your voice, it sounds real low, and it sounds like somebody else. It's me. Oh, it's okay. a trick. Very very cool song. Which songs to you guys? stand out on the album. Slaves and Bulldozers stands out quite a bit. Very, it's a powerful, grooving, hard song. Yeah, a lot of people seem to like that one. Yeah, I, always think of, I always think of our albums more in terms of albums as opposed to like picking out songs. It, it always seems like what we shoot for is an hour of music as opposed to um, a couple of lead tracks and, and then a B-side, you know? Kind of usually... thing you just put on and listen yeah. to the whole thing. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's 12 been... singles on one disc. Harry, it's a greatest hits album, all in one. It's, it's, it's the heavy metal white album. Now, it's definitely a powerful album. I mean, you guys play with a lot of emotion. Um, how could you say this different from, from the last Soundgarden record? Well, the last record was the alternative college rock white album. See, that's what people are saying. People are saying, oh, Soundgarden's an alternative band. And Soundgarden's Aren't this. And with this, you guys, I've heard that. Oh, I, don't, okay. I try yeah. not to label bands at all, but you, you can't help but hear them sometimes. But this is definitely a rock and roll record. I mean, yeah, it's heavy. yeah. And um, you guys are going to be going on the road pretty soon with us, right? We sure are. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we return with Soundgarden. But right now it's time for Skull Crusher number three, Motley Crue doing an old Pistols classic, Anarchy in the UK. Back with Chris and Kim from the band Soundgarden on the Headbangers Ball. And look, People Magazine. <laughs> Not only will you find out about Chris Efford's baby, but you will also hear a sound or see a Soundgarden review, read about a Soundgarden review, and they even give you guys a good review. Now, with this album, I mean, obviously the album's doing good. Yeah, so well. you guys are getting a much larder Soundgarden fan base. Yeah, we're getting a, we're getting a larder audience. <laughs> Did I say lard? <laughs> All yes. our fans were skinny, but now we got this, you know, <laughs> these big guys coming to the shows and girls. That's right. So it's not yeah. just more fans at the show; just they're much just larger. Fatter, yeah. So it just looks like they take up more. It's space. a larder audience. Well, how it works yeah. is how it works is you you have a delicious shake for breakfast, another one for lunch, <laughs> and then you go see a Soundgarden show and then have a sensible dinner. And that's what it is. But the uh -huh. Soundgarden, it it burns calories though. We do. Shows. We do. Now. In order for you to get, we, we tend to feed the fans, and then they stick their bad motor finger <laughs> down their throat. Everyone, that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> now, are you seeing a lot, a big cross section of Soundgarden fans now, like the old time Soundgarden fans? And you, can you say, oh, these people are obviously just gotten into the band because of bad motor finger? I hate to say it, but yeah, you can tell. You can. 
Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All the new Soundgarden fans are covered in invisible ink. They look like the old Soundgarden fans. Oh, mm. That's how it works. Well, thanks again for stopping by. Look for them, obviously, when they play with Guns N' Roses. I recommend this album. Go check it out. Thanks again for stopping by. Yes, the Headbangers Ball is coming to you from Prague on the Guns N' Roses tour, and Guns will be back a little later on. But right now, I'm joined by Soundgarden. Welcome back to MTV in Prague. How are you doing? Well, I've never been to Prague before, but... <laughs> It's nice to be back to MTV. Oh, thank you. Now, you guys have recently completed a tour stateside with Monster Magnet mm -hmm. and Swerve Driver, which sounds a pretty interesting lineup. How did that work out? It worked out, it worked out really great. We, we had fun. We got along with each other. What are you most looking forward to about this tour with guns? It's catering. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> is it difficult for you to adjust from like playing clubs and then back to stadiums and back well, to clubs? We'll see after tonight, won't we? We'll find out, see how it goes. Okay. It sure keeps it from being boring, though. You know, That's true. switching. Now, I've heard rumors of a possible live EP or something. Is that, have I heard correctly? No, um, we did kind of a sort of a, I guess you could call it a fairly live recording of some songs. At home, uh, a few months ago, that are going to be released, but it's not. It's not really a live recording. It's just like we didn't spend any time on it. We spent like you know one day recording a bunch of songs, and mm -hmm. uh, we did it for B sides, for singles and things, and and I got a good response from it. So we decided to make a limited edition EP. It'll be in the states. It'll be uh, sold free basically with with the copy of the record. And I don't know if it will be released over here. You know, if it is, I don't know what what way cool and what about um video are you going to be ever releasing like a home video or anything like that well in the states we just released rusty cage as a video in the u.s <laughs> Used for retail. i mean for retail you know video. yeah yeah okay yeah we did yeah we did that too we recorded ourselves live two nights at the paramount in seattle and i think they're working on editing and putting that together so yeah we'll see that is that going to be available to the fans in Europe? No, no. We, we specifically requested they don't sell it in Europe. It's only for Americans. <laughs> well, I think that we will have to get one of these clips off you guys when it's available and show you guys live in action. Okay. 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 So uh, thanks very much for joining me again. It's nice to see you. All right. And best of luck. Um, it's good to be seen. <laughs> best of luck on tour with Guns N' Roses. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Nejméně známá z té trojice Guns N' Roses Face No More. Uh, are you feel like stars now? No. No? No. And are you working for to be star? Are well, you going to be? No, only true stars are like dead or rock some musicians. Minor. Various constellations. We want to be wizards. Okay. And do you think that Face No More, for example, they are? Not really. Maybe. I don't know. Just That's... a bass player, Billy. He's a true star. <laughs> Really? You yeah. you mean it uh, seriously? No, I, I'm actually being quite sarcastic. About your music, so ah. Yeah, could you do that? Uh, oh, we had, we came up with a pretty good definition yesterday. It was it was a early '70s U.S. muscle car driving through the prom, <laughs> not to the prom, but right through the dance floor of the prom. So it is. Okay. <laughs> and your tonight show will be uh, really uh, loud? Yeah. Much more loud than other two bands? Oh, no. No, it won't, no. Be, it won't be. It won't be as loud. No. They usually, the way they set it up, they usually don't allow the first band to be louder than the headliner. Yeah. It's a rule. It's one of the stars. It's, it's etiquette in touring, in, at least in the US. And, Parts of Europe. Okay, and uh, we know that you are a big friend with Faith No More. Can you say how how was built the friendship? Um, they they were we were mutual fans, I guess, of each other's bands. We played a show together by chance, and we liked each other's bands, and eventually toured together in the states, and just became friends that way. Okay, and how you will feel in biggest stadium in the world? Is this really the biggest Tiny. stadium? It's the yeah. biggest, yeah, but... Are there big ones in Sao Paulo or Rio? Yeah, it's really biggest. Really? They said, they said. Oh. <laughs> we'll feel small like ants. <laughs> yeah, everyone should get their opera glasses if you're in the back row so you can watch us. Those opera visors. But you're looking forward. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, what are we looking forward? So, yeah. Oh, what are we looking for? Uh, I suppose doing the tour, selling a bunch of records, and going home. Okay. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for your time. Hello. Okay. Hi, Chris. Hi. This kind of a wet set, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Does it make your set different when the audience is wet, when the weather is awful, when there's thunder and lightning? I think the lightning was kind of cool, but other than that, it was, you know, it was the same as a big normal rock show with, with, with the stage lights coming from God, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now tell me, Chris, um, the noise that you make, or is noise the wrong word? The noise that you make does fit to this weather. Yeah, I think so. I think noise is the perfect word. Now, what do you want to reach with this noise? Do you want to spread aggression? Um, no, not really. Just want to make some sounds that maybe people might not hear the rest of the day. What is so attractive to making this sound? Um, I, it's fun. It's like a, a little kid with a really big toy. Okay, it's fun, but it's so loud. Maybe. Why are you saying you don't like it? Yeah, well, I like it. Rusty no, no, Kate. come on. Don't, he's lying to you, people. He's lying. He's well, right. no, 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 no. Um, I like some parts of it, but ah. it's but it's so loud all over. It's constantly loud. I know. Can you believe it? Yeah. Yeah. How difficult is it to put lyrics in a song like this? It's easy. I mean, it's it's no different than putting lyrics over a, a soft song, really. You just take the mood of the music and and uh, write whatever inspires you first. You don't mind the rain, do you? No. no! Oh, you know everybody on tour? Do you, do you know most of the bands? Uh, we're we're getting to know all the bands. We know we know uh, like Pearl Jam and the Chili Peppers, uh, Ministry guys are really cool. Yeah. We're getting to know. Yeah. We're really down with Ice Cube, and uh, <laughs> I guess we know everybody. Figure you're winning over people all the time. This is a great we opportunity always win to people over. To steal an audience, maybe? We're more likely to win someone over than disappoint them. I can, only, no, I can disappoint him, but I, not Vancouver. No. <laughs> Sorry. no. I miss you, Atlanta there. You doing anything different? Are you, have you shortened your set for this? No, we lengthened it from the Guns tour where we were doing a half an hour, and now we're doing 45, 45 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, do you get an encore? No. No, you're out of there. Do you get a sound check? No, uh, we're, we're out of one. there. Do you get your catering? Yes. Does your rider still apply? Yeah. No, no cigarettes. <laughs> oh, but not all of it. We get the it. beer and the water. Is it decadence? No. <laughs> no. No decadence. Politically correct. <laughs> when you come back on your own, come back quietly, slip into town and play, will you? Yeah. We will. Hey, uh, we'll slip it in quietly. Thank you. Did you get a chance to see any of the other bands play at all? I've seen everybody except uh, Lush so far. Uh, who's the best? Who did you like the best? Ah, uh, Soundgarden. Who'd you like second best? Ah, uh, Soundgarden. I think was good. They came in like a close second to us, but. Welcome, guys. <laughs> this is Soundgarden, and as you know, if you haven't seen the show yet, they're on Lollapalooza 92. It's okay. <laughs> She's weaving. They're on Lollapalooza 92 right now, and I got to see it Sunday and had a great time. Is it as much fun to like play and be a part of that whole traveling road show as it is to watch, would you assume? It's much fun to make as it is to eat. <laughs> it's actually more fun because... You, we get to be there every day, so, you know, we see the good shows and the bad shows and the weird things you don't expect. So, um, yeah. in your in your show, one of the surprises I thought when I checked you out was that you play Cop Killer, the, the big controversial Ice-T song. Now, uh, what's your take on that? You obviously feel something about it if you include it in your set. Yeah, well, it was as simple as the idea that if, if uh, for some reason, uh, record companies or people who manipulate the media or uh, people who try and... and uh, influence it want there to be a situation where people can't decide what they will buy and what they will hear you know we'll take it upon ourselves to do what we can get away with and and uh you know spit it back in their face and playing you know if playing the song every day you know helps do that then then uh that's that's a good enough reason to play it
So, so that's kind of a controversial cover, but you also include covers from like Devo, Sabbath. There's a, how do you, what's your take on covers? Are there any uh, targets in the future? We have like a crystal ball and it's, we just, you know, we take the little thing off of it when we want to do a cover and we just kind of look for it. And uh, we're going to do uh, Hocus Pocus by Focus next, I think. That was the last one that came up, right? And <laughs> we got to stop using that thing. God. So what, what, how about, could you each tell us like a couple artists that you, yeah, yeah, Ben. Um, some artists that people would be surprised that Soundgarden likes. Like, is there like kind of a skeleton in your closet that you listen to? <laughs> no. Like, did you take ABBA or anything? No, I don't. Uh, I like uh, Bjorn again. Uh, yeah, have you heard of them? Yeah, English band. They're an ABBA cover band. band. Yeah, all they do is ABBA, which is amazing. There's a French guy that does all Tom Waits stuff in French, too, which is pretty amazing. Um, there's a girl over here who's kind of, she's wigging over here, and we're going to have to get her a paramedic. We love you. But she had a question. It was a really good question. After uh -huh. after uh, the Temple of the Dog record and Andrew Wood's uh, death, mm -hmm. did um, did it, it did it change how you saw, like, intake of, you know, drugs and alcohol and living the rock and roll life? No, it's funny that you would ask that, though, because people have asked us that before. And Seattle was never that kind of city where it was like this drug-influenced rock culture of people, like, going to raves and 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 uh, getting really high and it's always been more of a cynical kind of music culture and that's you know that's one side of it but it had it, it wasn't that sort of party atmosphere drug use you know um, as far as as that scene goes it happens in every city and with every walk of life from lawyers to uh, doctors who who abuse drugs more than almost anybody um, as well as musicians you know so um so um, on Lollapalooza, who's like your favorite to watch? Do you stick around and check out the show? Um, well, we do like the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow. It is fun. Yeah. Um, and it makes people faint. <laughs> <laughs> I like to watch Pearl Jam a lot. Mm -hmm. And you, um, and as and if you could just like set the record straight, I saw you, you sing back up occasionally for Pearl Jam for sometimes, a tune. Kind yeah. of wander on back there. You don't like take the center stage. And then Eddie helps you guys out sometimes. Right. But... Is, are you, is anybody here Temple of the Dog or not? Just let them know. Oh, it, I couldn't tell you. I mean, we we may do something from it some at some point. We may not. We may just jam together as two bands. You never know. We haven't yet. Okay. <clears throat> but you know that was like that album we did over a year ago, and honestly, I don't think we really remember how to play it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Wow, well, everybody still really digs it. Definitely yeah. a great album, no matter when people discover it. Ministry too is amazing to see. <clears throat> on that tour it's amazing well you guys are rocking yourselves and uh, we gotta go Thanks. and uh, if you go to Lollapalooza please check out Soundgarden hi and welcome back to this the final part of tonight's show now you know as well as I know that things are changing in the world of rock and roll we're getting some great new bands coming through with a whole new attitude and I think these two guys who are sitting next to me are, are very much a part of that this is Chris Cornell and Matt Cameron from Soundgarden hello it's nice to see you chaps it's nice to see you now, <laughs> Obviously, all of a sudden, the, the band has really broken big. I know that from what we were having a quick chat about earlier, you've been doing this for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Does it seem kind of strange that all of a sudden people are talking about Soundgarden as this new happening band? Yeah, we get that a lot. I mean, you know, record after record, when you break into a new market, I mean, we may have been an alternative band for for five or six or seven years. Before it was fashionable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, you, all of a sudden... You know, a new medium sort of will embrace you and, and sort of say, here's a new band. And you kind of just have to bear with it because it is new to them. There was too many bad rock bands out there that were a little too popular. And um, there were some good trends like Jane's Addiction getting real popular and then Faith No More. And now, of course, you know, Nirvana getting real popular. Um, it proves that there's a crowd out there that's that's into, you know, different styles instead of just what's shoved down their throat by radio and MTV. You seem to think that the Seattle scene is uh, starting to develop something of a tendency of what happened in L.A. in the past. Is that right? Well, yeah. There's sort of, a, like, a lot of people moving there from other cities in the U.S., you know, to start a band because there's so many bands that are successful out of there. And uh, there's also, like, a lot of young bands starting out that are thinking about trying to get a record deal more than thinking about like trying to have fun playing music or writing songs, which 
Seems like it'll eventually be the poise and they'll kill the Seattle scene. So what about Avshar in the new video, which we're just going to have a look at in a minute? I haven't actually seen it, I must confess, uh -oh. so you have to give me the big scoop on it. Uh-oh. Okay, I'll tell you what, it may be one of two versions that uh, we made, because we made two different versions with two different directors. And I don't know which one you're going to show, and I know that you don't either, so... So we're all in the dark here, and yeah. I'm pretty excited to find out what's going to happen. This is Sam Garden, and this is Outshine. Oh, it's exactly. been a pleasure talking to you anyway. Thanks, man. Great to have you down. Nice right. to see you, man. Nice to see nice you. Nice to see you, Chris. You guys are watching the Pepsi Power 30. We have a very special guest today, guitarist Kim Style from Soundgarden. You guys have taken a break from uh, the Guns N' Roses tour and uh, you're playing in Toronto. Yep, just a coffee break, though. Just a little coffee break? Yeah. No, we're going back. You're going back? And how's that going? Going back? No. <laughs> how's the tour going? Oh, it's going pretty well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. We're having a blast, believe yeah. it or not. Could, was that insincere? It was insincere, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm having a blast. Are, are the fans uh, really up for the shows? Um, yeah, they have to stand up because there are no chairs, so they're <laughs> stage diving, running around. They're having, yeah. Did you think when you went into this tour that you're going to encounter mostly Guns N' Roses fans? Oh, we do fine? encounter a few. I mean, there's, there's definitely people, you know, off to the right, off to the left, you hear some boos and hisses. But they get drowned out really quickly by the people yelling. And by the guitar, I'm sure. Yeah, plus uh, Ben and I and Chris tend to walk over to the wings of the stage and flip off the people booing. <laughs> the next thing they do is light their lighter and applaud. I guess they need a little bit of abuse to Absolutely, people to like abuse. appreciate you. <laughs> well, it didn't take too long for people to appreciate your videos. Um, we're going to start off with your latest one, Outshined. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, let's see. Um, it's called Outshined. The song is, I'm not really sure how long. I can't tell you anything about it. Because <laughs> we did it in uh, L.A. We recorded it. At, well, something new. I wish I could say we recorded it in Peoria, but we didn't. Are you happy with the video? Um, I and the song, the way it's come out? <sighs> can we go to commercial? <laughs> Let's play outside on the Power 30. All right, you're back on the Power 30. Kim File, guitarist for Soundgarden, guest hosting the show today. Kim, we're going to play your picks now, and you have decided on... Hey, you guys only let me play two picks. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> the nature of the 30-minute show, you know? That's right. Let's see. Let's take up 15 minutes with uh, only Soundgarden videos. And with these <laughs> last two, I think we'll play some of our friends from Seattle. I don't know if they get played here much, but they will now. And who are they? Pearl Jam. They have a song out called Alive. Yeah, we play them. And uh, Tad, okay. Stumbling Man. Okay, why did you pick these two? Uh, because they're from Seattle. Because they're from Seattle? Yeah. A little bit of nepotism there. Yeah, huh? a bit of nepotism. It's like, they're not actually brothers, but because if they were, I wouldn't be able to marry them. <laughs> but they're friends, you guys uh, Yeah, we're out? friends. Yeah, I was telling play you, tennis? play tennis <laughs> together. <laughs> Someone mentioned three-quarters court. <laughs> Tad and I play tennis. It's kind of like... I told you to hit it right there. I'm not chasing after it. You go get it. <laughs> hey, Pearl Jam are real huge fans of Rush. How do you guys feel about them? About Rush? Rush? Well, our drummer's, a, I mean, he, Neil Peart's definitely one of his uh, inspirations. Rush was something, you know, they're a great band. I listened to them when I was growing up. I was kind of forced upon me. All my friends would sit around and uh, partake in you know, sort of sit around with friends sort mm -hmm. of things. Party. Yeah, and then they listen to uh, Rush. So... 2112. So you can understand that then. We used to do a Rush song. We used to do Working Man as a cover. Do you ever do it anymore? Uh, no, we don't. Oh, wow. Well. In Toronto. We Rush could. We could. Home ground. Uh, we have to rehearse it. So we could remember it. Okay, let's play then. Um, Alive? Okay. Alive? By Pearl Jam. By Pearl Jam. Mm -hmm. And Tad as well. Yeah, hi, Eddie. And Tad as well. Okay. On the part of 30. Uh, we're going to play um, Jesus Christ Pose now, but I wanted to ask you uh, how you feel about some of the negative viewer response we've had on it. I mean, we, we had one guy right in saying mm -hmm. that they felt you were mocking Jesus. <laughs> well, <laughs> and he's obviously very Christian, and yeah. you know, it, it insulted him in some way. Well, uh, you know, he's not part of our audience, and we're not writing songs for him. I mean, we we have to be accountable to ourselves first, and to the people who write us. He was actually a Mantle fan, though. Obviously, but not a song or fan of that bothers him. How did you mean for the song to be perceived? Well, there's enough ambiguity in it that it allows for that kind of misinterpretation or other various interpretations. It's not mocking Jesus, though. It's not mocking Jesus. Why would we want to mock Jesus? 
that you got a Christian church to do that for you. They can mock Jesus. Well, this, this had nothing to do with that. It was actually, the whole song was about people who exploit the, the crucifixion and Jesus' name and image for their own benefit. The commercialization of it or the, uh, or the whole paranoid messianic uh, martyr complex. A lot of entertainers tend to come up with, you know, rock stars, movie actors, and, um, and also some television evangelists. So it's just a slap at those people. Now, I think anyone would be happy that we're slapping at someone who's like misrepresenting uh, something that is dear to a lot of people's hearts. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a killer video. And I mean, whenever anybody sees it, it's just like they're glued to the TV set. But there's one other thing that this, nobody's written to us about this. This is just coming from us. Ooh. Why did you pick the form of a female to be up on the cross? I mean, Jesus was a guy. Yeah. That's probably one reason why I picked it. And more people are crucified than Jesus. A lot more people. I mean, it was, it was the standard method of barbaric you know, execution in those days. And I'm sure women and many other men were crucified. And you could have asked us why we put a salad on the cross, too. <laughs> Little vegetable. Nuts and bolts. Mr. Potato Head or whatever. Um, just to get, a, just to present the other visual images other than the traditional one. Okay. Which is a long-haired white guy with blue eyes. It's like, man, there's a lot of blue-eyed people in the Mideast who went there back then, North <laughs> Africa. You know, Hitler did that and made Christ blue-eyed. You know that. <laughs> All right, Kim, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, don't we get to introduce the Tad Stumbling Man video? That was that last throw. <laughs> okay. We already played that one. Oh, I already did. Never mind. Why don't you introduce your own video? Okay, this is a Jesus Christ pose. It's a real long video. I hope it doesn't hurt your feelings. Ja, hi, ich bin der Dese und ich gebe heute mein äh, Rockhard Video Debüt und Mann oh Mann, das finde ich gleich mit Soundgarden statt und das ist ziemlich super crunchy manche. Äh, neben uns sitzen äh, Kim Tayil, Gitarrist von Soundgarden und Ben Shepard. Hi. Uh, there is a new single out over here in Germany which features two outshine versions and a cover of um, one of my favorite Devo songs and uh, and the cover of a Black Sabbath song. Is this the kind of melting pot sound garden comes from? Yeah, I, I think we all have, um, we come from pretty much early you know, punk rock roots and a lot of the post-punk music of the 80s, you know, Butthole Surfers, uh, Big Black, Scratch Acid. Yeah. And as well, we also like the guitar rock of the 60s and 70s. So it's a little bit of both, I mean. Could you do me a favor and uh, tell me something about the bad motor finger. Is this a bad motor finger? Is this a bad motor finger? Is this a bad motor finger? Or is this a bad motor finger? This one. <laughs> so, so what's your favorite version of a bad motor finger? I think it could be a spark plug in an engine. Or it could be a really, a really uh, bumpy highway. You know, ba a, a bad, you know, like the Autobahn had a bunch of holes in it. That's maybe no. a, a bad motor finger. But isn't there a new movement going on, this thing called Super Crunchy Munchy Vava Distortion Psycho Rifle Terror Electro Guitars thing, which is really <laughs> different to the things Metallica are doing nowadays? Isn't there a new heaviness coming on? He, yeah. Yeah, there, there probably is. I mean, if you're talking about... Uh, like stepping wolf on a badass and trip <laughs> mixed with uh, MC5. Yeah. Yeah. You talk so. about the bands in Seattle, and you look at Monster Magnet or uh, and yeah. Detroit bands like Big Saint Chief, Vitus. Saint Vitus, Big Chief in Detroit. Right? Yeah, surprise, surprise! Uh, as I promised you, in Seattle, uh, I've got some Saint Vitus CDs and Obsessed CDs with me. Uh, those CDs you can't get in the States. Wow. Uh, may you open this big thing? You told me a story about Saint Vitus that they wrote you to SST. Well, they were very helpful. Um, we had played a show with St. Vitus in Seattle, maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago. St. Vitus, Butthole Surfer, Soundgarden, and the U-Men. And St. Vitus were, I guess they said good things to us, about us, to uh, your Greg Ginn and the guys from SST and uh -huh. Black Flag, as, you know, other, as well as other bands. And they helped get assigned SST. Our first shows we ever played in L.A., you know, Wino came down to see 
Ja, und das war das Soundgarden-Interview. Heute Abend kicken Sie Yes mit COC im Tor 3. Wir gucken es uns auf jeden Fall an. Für all die, die nicht das Glück haben, diese durchweg ausverkauften Shows in Deutschland zu sehen, könnten sich ja Soundgarden im Vorprogramm von Guns N' Roses angucken. Die Tour ist für Herbst angesagt. Yes, Headbangers Ball is coming to you from Birmingham, UK, and that video for Outshined heralds the arrival of tonight's very special guests all the way from Seattle. Soundgarden, Kim and Chris have joined me on Headbangers Ball, and welcome. Thank you. Now, you guys are winding up a European tour. How's that been working out for you? Really awful, actually. <laughs> no, it's it's been good. Um, so all the shows have been sold out, and a lot of the fans seem to be really acquainted with our records, which is kind of different than the last few times we were here. Uh, definitely different, but it's um, good. Obviously, headlining is very different to what you were doing in the States, supporting Guns N' Roses in arenas, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. And uh, we've got lots of time to talk tonight because the band have joined me for pretty much the entire show, and I'd like to start really the obvious place, Seattle. Now, is there a Seattle sound, or do you think it's just that people are focusing their attention on the area because of bands like yourselves and Pearl Jam and Nirvana? I think it's the second thing you said there. Because uh, Queensryche and War Babies and some of the other bands don't exactly fit into that. that no, not right. really. <laughs> Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Soundgarden don't really fit into any particular style of music either. They're different from each other. Mm -hmm. So it is primarily um, the region that's getting attention more than anything else. Right. Now, um, one would assume that there is a lot of camaraderie between the bands in Seattle because obviously you teamed up with the band we now know as Pearl Jam for Temple of the Dog. And also, Chris, you actually contributed vocals to Alice in Chains' new EP, Sap. So uh, is there, is, do the bands kind of work together a lot and influence each other? Well, it's, a, it's all sort of a managerial type of thing. You know, we all completely hate each other. And, the, you know, the, all these things are just arranged by, like, the Seattle kingpins, you know, yeah. cigar chomping <laughs> people. They just usher us around in limousines and we sort of perform on each other's records. They get us together during picnics and take photos and release them around. See, they are friends. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they insist on this unity thing. I'm just really getting tired. You can't see the chains and shackles on us while we're sitting there having soup and sandwiches with our best friends from Seattle. <laughs> now, um, did, did you enjoy working with um, Eddie Vedder, Jeff Ament, and Stone Gozard on, on the Temple of the Dog album? Did it kind of give you a, a, fun, a chance yeah. to try a different creative approach you know, to the Sound Garden format? Well, um, Chris. <laughs> I, I don't know. I do a lot of things that that don't fit into the, necessarily fit into the, like the regular Soundgarden format that was just like one of the things that I've done um but as far as working with those guys as musicians it was great you know of course you you did it to pay tribute to your friend Andrew Wood who who died um who yeah the love bone did you find that ther therapeutic and kind of getting over his loss well I suppose we all because we all had a, such a good time doing it you know that they're there must have been a certain amount of like catharsis in, in it but I there was a couple songs really that were attributed to Andy but and that that started the idea but once the ball got rolling the the whole thing was really just just the collaboration and, and just uh, you know playing together as musicians it wasn't like this writing a funeral piece or something okay well, we're going to see the results of that collaboration um, because coming up now we've got the video from Temple of the Dog and this is Hunger Strike. I'm still here with tonight's very special guests, Kim and Chris from Soundgarden. We'll be meeting new bassist Ben a little later on. But for now, guys, um, maybe you could talk about the Guns N' Roses tour in the States. You've been in arenas with them recently. What kind of challenges did that throw up for you and kind of did you learn anything from it? Well, we threw up a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that was challenging in and yeah. of itself. I don't really, I don't know if there was any particular challenge that we hadn't already been through. I mean, we've we've, we've done a lot of been in a lot of situations where we played in front of audiences that didn't know who we were. I think more than Shit. learning, you just sort of get you. It's like you get used to a situation over a period of time without actually thinking about it. I mean, right. coming back and being on small stages does seem kind of weird sometimes right. when. You wouldn't think that it would because that's you know all we did for a number of years. So good. it's good to do both. I mean, we did that on that tour. We played our own shows and we'd play like thousand seat, and then we'd play like a dome or something the next day. So the contrast was pretty strange. 
I mean, how did you get on with, with Axel and Co? Did you? Just fine. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I mean, um, did you see their decadent kind of lifestyle? Those like, pigs. In complete opposition <laughs> to your own kind of low key philosophy. Oh, I don't. I don't think they're particularly any more decadent than what would sell a magazine piece, or or what would sell a video piece. Mm, but the whole it's such a uh, such a big setup, isn't it? Loads of security and loads of people backstage. Be, and you know, secure. Yeah, it's the same at a soccer game, right? Soccer match. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose you could be backstage with Soundgarden and decide that it was decadent. <laughs> We're awful pigs. <laughs> I mean, how do you judge success? Is it a good gig? A By good the size, of, size or... of the deli tray you get All backstage. Right. Like, you call this cheese? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. No, seriously. I mean, it's not, I don't, I guess for you guys, it's not album sales, is it? It's. Well, I guess that would be one barometer of success. Even if you're doing what you want to do and you love it, and nobody else likes it at all, you know, it's sort of hard to consider it successful by like any normal standards. Mm. Has anything surprised you about your success so far? That we had so success. Yeah, that is that, surprising. That in itself is a surprise. Because our records aren't, uh, you know, obvious uh, commercial records with obvious singles mm. and, you know, radio hits. You can't dance to Soundgarden songs and you're not likely to go shopping with your girlfriends while listening to Soundgarden material, so. You can dance to Soundgarden oh, songs, guess, but it's embarrassing. Say, I agree with you, there. <laughs> it's you look silly. <laughs> well, it's kind of like playing I go shopping chess. with my husband listening to Soundgarden records. <laughs> you know, we're not like an obviously commercial right. band, but they, there's a lot of bands over a period of time that have more success than commercial bands just because, you know, what they're doing is, is outside the norm and it's what they want to do, which is pretty, it's pretty easy to at some point tell if a band that you're into is like doing something they want to do or doing something for some other reason. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll talk more about Bad Motorpinger later on. We've got plenty of time to talk. But right now we're going to see a band making their debut on Headbangers Ball. They come from New York. They're called White Zombie. I don't know if you've heard no, of these cool guys. Band. We played with them before. Yeah? They've been around for a little while. Yeah, they have. They've got um, their debut album out on the Geffen label called uh, La Sex or Sisto Devil Music Volume 1. And uh, this is the first single, Thunder Kiss 65. And check out those dreadlocks. New York band White Zombie making their debut on Headbangers Ball. And we're back now with the stars of tonight's show, Soundgarden. And Kim is still with me, but now I've been joined by a new bass player, Ben. Hi, Ben. Welcome to MTV. Now, uh, actually, I've got a question for Kim first, and this is a viewer's question sent in by Kate O'Malley from Ireland. She'd like to know why both um, previous bassists, Hiro Yamamoto and Jason Everman, left the band. Um, Hiro left on his own free will. He was, he'd been in the band for five years, and he, I think he wanted to pursue other interests. Mm -hmm. He's gone back to school, and he's studying chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and then... The way I see, we pretty much had two bass players. You know, we had Hero, and he played on the records up until then, and then Ben's on the new record. In the interim, there was we had a bass player, Jason, who was with us for six months, and um, I, I think things weren't working out. I think when Hero left, it was a, a definite big hole in the band, and, and it would have been a lot of pressure for anyone to fill the shoes at that point in time, and it wasn't working out. We figured. That Ben, Ben's personality and creativity and attitude was was far more of what we're of what we're looking for and what was appropriate for Soundgarden time. What 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 did you think was so special about Ben that he was going to fit into Soundgarden? It's it had a lot to do with with uh, the creativity, the insight. Um, his talents are are beyond just being a musician. I mean, it's good to have to draw from other influences, whether it's whether it's film or writing or. Mm -hmm. It's good to have a person who just under, who has an insight into 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 social issues and artistic and aesthetic issues, mm -hmm. you know, to begin with. You, you need to be a person who's interesting, I, I think, to, in order to make interesting music. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, I've got a question for you as well. Um, the song "Somewhere," which you contributed to Bad Motor Finger, did you write that before you were in the band, or did you write it especially for Soundgarden? No. The lyrics were jumbled and written, I think, before I was in the band, but I'm not sure because they're all jumbled up in this book. 
uh, music I wrote while I was in the band. And Jesus Christ Pose is, um, we're actually going to talk about that song later on, but just preliminarily, um, that was the so only song on the album where all four members were credited. Now, is that a trend for kind of songwriting in the, in the future? For us? Yeah. For other bands? It might be a trend for other bands <laughs> in the future. No, it's <laughs> pretty standard for us to make up songs yeah. out of a jam. Mm -hmm. That's where that song comes from. Right. Okay. Well, uh, right now we've got our first commercial break coming up, um, but before that we're going to check out Soundgarden live on stage here at the Institute in Birmingham. But okay, I'm going to go down and get my guitar. <laughs> but please stick around um, because the Headbangers Ball will continue with more from Soundgarden a little bit later on. Hi, welcome back to Headbangers Ball, coming to you from the Institute in Birmingham with special guests Soundgarden and Kim and Chris are back with me on the show. And in fact, uh, we met Ben a little earlier. We won't actually be meeting up with Matt, the drummer, because unfortunately he's, he's not too well, nothing serious. I no, he's just got a little boo-boo, nothing a band-aid can't help. Boo-boo? <laughs> What's that? He fell down and went boom. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> now we're going to concentrate uh, on your lyrics for the next few minutes and uh, oh, it no. seems that you kind of have the ethic that uh, less is more and when I was talking to Eddie <laughs> Vedder from Pearl Jam he said that one of the most satisfying aspects of um, Pearl Jam was hearing other people's interpretations of, of his songs what they thought the mm -hmm. songs meant yeah. is that the same for you guys well I, I don't tend to really want to listen to other people's interpretations of them I want other people to have interpretations of them <laughs> as long as they don't talk to me about them <laughs> So, um, well, is that not hand, sort of useful feedback? Well, no, I, it, I don't think in, I don't think of lyric writing in terms of feedback or you know drawing ideas about what I do from somebody else. I think it just comes from me, you know. I, and I don't, I don't want to say I don't care what somebody else thinks or how they feel about my lyrics. <laughs> I. I just don't, um, I don't think it has anything to do with my lyrics, that's all. Now, where does your inspiration come from? Is it um, from kind of reading books or personal experience or TV or? It could be, it could be from any, any of those things. It could mm. be from like something I'm reading or something uh, somebody says or something I see on television or just like none of the above where I'm just like walking around all of a sudden an idea just pops into my head. Mm. It's similar to music, I guess, in that. You know, you sort of will draw from from anything that inspires you to write music as well as lyrics. Mm -hmm. We're not really artists. We're actually vessels and agents of the fourth dimension where this world exists. It consists entirely of lyrics and music, and we're just a you know, conductor for that. Or funnel. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I could highlight the song New Damage, um, is that a comment about America or the world in general? Um, the world in general. Yeah. Okay. And Holy Water. Mm -hmm. um, now, that is that about religion in particular, or is the message that people should not be dictated to and should make up their own minds how to live? Yeah, the second, the latter of what you just said yeah. is pretty much, that, that could pretty much sum that song up, mm -hmm. really. It's, um, it's a message that way, or, or a, if you want to take it as a personal thing, you know, feeling that way when, 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 someone's ideas they'll try to to put on my shoulders. Kim, you made your debut as a lyricist on Room a Thousand Years Wide. You've heard this all before. Um, was the music the inspiration for that yeah, song? Yeah, Or was it vice versa? Yeah, it was, it was the music. Because Matt wrote the music in the yeah, instant, didn't he? I liked it quite a bit, so I wanted to come up with lyrics for it. There's kind of a religious connotation to that Well, that's song. really funny. You were talking about lyrics earlier and how people interpret them. We had uh, some people coming up and saying, Room a Thousand Years Wide, that's about Satan, isn't it? And I said, ah, let's Your... see. Hmm. And then you have other people come up and go, Room a Thousand Years Wide, that's, that's about Jesus, isn't it? I said, well, yeah, okay. Jesus, Satan, it's about that. Maybe other people come up and say, it's about Jesus and Satan. Right? The left and the right hand. And Ooh, Kim would say yeah. this, his typical response is, well, you're so vain, you, I bet you think this song is about you. <laughs> right. Well, I think we should uh, let the listeners of the album make up their, their own minds on that one. Okay, we've got some more music on the way. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this band called Antidote New York City. 
They're making their debut on Headbangers Ball. Another brand new video for you. Uh, these guys come from New York. They have a debut album out on April the 13th called Viva Los Pendejos. And this is the first single and it's called Return to Burn. That was uh, Antidote, New York City, making their debut on Headbangers Ball, another cool band mixing lots of different influences, as I'm sure you realized from that video. And right now, um, Kim and Ben are back with me on the Headbangers Ball from Birmingham, Sound Garden special. And um, I guess a uh, good question to involve Ben with. Um, there's a, this album seems to be a lot more diverse in terms of the, of the style of, of, of the various different songs. To what do you attribute that new diversity? Do you think uh, Ben's brought some influences there? Oh, I thought you were asking Ben this well, question. Well, <laughs> both of you. Um, I'd like to know what you both yeah, think. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with having a fourth songwriter mm -hmm. and contributor. And what are your influences, Ben? Uh, from Johnny Cash to Charles Mingus to Killing Joke to SPK, whatever. Very diverse. Yeah. Um, do, do you think that you guys took any risks on Bad Motor Finger? No, we played it pretty safe. We were kind of, <laughs> <laughs> we thought, look, you guys, we better not try that. They won't play it. No, we, I don't we're think. that bad. <laughs> no, I don't think we had to consciously take any risks. It, it just. We write songs, and if we like the song, we'll play it or we'll, we'll, we'll record it. So, I don't, I don't think there's, just do what you do. <laughs> do, you, do you find that your anger comes out in your, in your music? Anger about the state yeah. of the world? Yeah, I'd say so. Because we don't run around hitting people very often, so. <laughs> I, think, I think the, um, the music is the best way to express that. Mm -hmm. But uh, something that I feel is possibly overlooked a lot with Soundgarden is, is your sense of humour. Does that annoy you that people often overlook that aspect? They think you're so serious well, some, and intense. Well, sometimes it's more annoying if people, if people focus on it like, oh, Soundgarden, they're, they're kind of a tongue-in-cheek bunch of guys. It's like, I think it's just a way to offset the anger and the hostility, you know? Because it's just a way, I mean, you can, you can be the kind of person you are, then when you have to live in a world, have relationships with people like yourself or press or record company or fans. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. And uh, we've got another commercial break coming up. We're going to see some more from Soundgarden live in just a moment. But please stay tuned because after the break, I'll be meeting up with Soundgarden support band Corrosion of Conformity. Yay! Yeah. Hi, welcome back to Headbangers Ball, coming to you from the Institute in Birmingham. Just before the break there, you saw COC live on stage here at this venue. And right now I'm back with the stars of tonight's show, and that is Soundgarden. And Kim and Chris are still here. And uh, we've got the video for Jesus Christ Pose coming up in a little while. And uh, I'd like to sort of focus on that song, very interesting song. Now, um, some people may think it's a song about religion, which um, I don't believe it is. It's, it's, is it more accusing society of using a, an image to, to kind of get a point across? Yeah, <laughs> that, that is it. It is. Is it? Mm -hmm. More or less. Uh -huh. But I also felt there was an element of, of maybe saying, don't preach at me when you're kind of not perfect yourself. Well, no, not really. I mean, it's just sort of being annoyed with people using that symbol for like, for their own personal vanity or um, gain, exploiting use. it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I guess in the States, um, it, it's kind of different because over in Europe, we don't have those kind of television sort of television. creatures. Well, it's not just that. I mean, you have, you do have entertainers and you have uh, you know, pop stars and yeah, the movie idea, actors. So it could the refer idea didn't to come, any of them. Yeah, the idea didn't, didn't come from uh, televangelists or... or uh, um, religious organizations. I mean, it came from seeing um, models, fashion models, and like pop stars doing that pose or doing videos where they're tied to the cross or whatever. You know, it putting themselves in like the persecuted deity uh, situation. Mm -hmm. it just, I, I just saw a lot of it over a period of a few months, and that's where the idea from the song came from. Right. So it isn't really religious at all. It's perhaps one of the least accessible tracks on the, on the album. Why did you choose it as the first single here in, in the UK? Because it, uh, it has a good beat. And you can dance, dance, dance to it. it and, <laughs> you can go um, shopping to it. It's very yeah. colourful. The song is definitely... I think as a song, it's fairly definitive of, of Soundgarden, at least a particular 
side of us. Mm-hmm. Right. And the video has a kind of very kind of avant-garde art feel, as you'll see in a moment. Did, do you enjoy making videos, or do you feel that that's an area that's kind of out of your control to some degree? Well, it, it is, I think, out of everyone's control to a degree as far as getting what you, exactly what you want. Mm. Um, but I think making a record can be that way too. It, it's just a lot more difficult because you have a lot less time than you have when you make a record right. um, to, from actually meeting the director and discussing the ideas and the techniques and then actually doing the shooting the video, you know, which can be a day or two right. and then editing, you know, you might see two or three different edits. It's, it's like, um, you have an idea of what the kind of record you want to make before you make it. And then, actually making that record is a lot more likely than having an idea for a video and actually making the video that you want. But you were pretty happy with the realization of this one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Looking back over your career now, when you you listen to your albums and think about them, would you say that they're they're kind of biographical, this is how I was then, this is how I am now kind well, of thing? Well, they're classics. <laughs> <laughs> you know. they, see, they stand the test of time, really. Doesn't... I mean, when you th- listen to that album, you don't think, well, that's how I felt when I wrote that song. Well, I think you always do. You know, you remember where you were when you wrote it and what you were thinking or how you felt or what you were wearing or where you lived or whatever. No, and but I mean, definitely you know, always you're, you're do. maturing as people as well, I'm sure. You know. Yeah, there's things I think you can consider like <laughs> progressing and things you can consider like digressing, I guess, either way. Okay. Um, Okay, um, and just very quickly, we're reaching the end of our um, our interview here. You've got um, European arena shows coming up with Guns N' Roses. Are you mm-hmm. looking forward to those? Yeah, yeah definitely. It's really exciting. Okay. As um, well as the Faith No More, I think. Yeah, they're yes. on the bill as yeah, well. That's gonna be we haven't seen those guys in a while either. Okay. It's, it's, they're quite a bit of fun. All right. Well, thanks for, for that for now. And uh, we're going to see uh, Sound Garden. Sound Garden. Get it right, Vanessa. Soundgarden live on stage here at Birmingham again. Um, Coming up very shortly, uh, and then after the break, the guys will be back to choose the metal collection. So I'm sure you'll be interested to see which videos they've chosen. But for now, here they are live. Hi, and welcome back to the Headbangers Ball, coming to you from Birmingham with special guest Soundgarden. And uh, we finished the interviews now, really. And all that remains is... uh, the metal collection, which uh, in case I guess you, you guys don't know, but here in Europe, this is the part of the show where we play What Do You Say. Um, normally it's chosen by a viewer, but tonight we're going to ask you to choose the videos to play out the rest of the show. So uh, if you could give us your video choice and why you've chosen these particular tracks. See, I think the first video I'd like to see is Motorhead's oh. Angel City. Featuring the cycle sluts from hell. Cool. Um, how about... Uh... Mother Love Bone. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a track called Star Dog mm-hmm. Champion. And then I think I'd like to see uh, Voivod, I think. Maybe. Okay. Excellent. The Clouds new, in My uh, House from the, the new, new album. Boy, Angel Rat. Angel yeah. Rat. Cool album. And we're going to kick off the proceedings with... A prom. Prom because prom. they're uh, because they're heavy and... And, and it was all we could think of right now. They're good <laughs> looking and... <laughs> But really, why did you why did you want to see the Voivod video? Um, because it was off the top of my head, right there at the. Okay. <laughs> okay, so actually, Prong are going to be guests on Headbangers Ball in the not too distant future, hopefully. And here they are with their newest video, and this is the title track of their current album, "Prove You Wrong." That was the metal collection as chosen for you by tonight's very special guest, Soundgarden. And if you'd like to take part in the metal collection, send your four favourite videos of all time to the usual Headbangers Ball address. And we're really, really reaching the end of our show now. And uh, all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for joining me here on Headbangers Ball. And uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it was uh, fun being here. Best of luck with everything and thank you very much. Thanks. I'm Chris. I'm Kim. We're Soundgarden, and you're watching Raw Raw Power. Power. The first time we came over here, we were touring um, to support our first LP, which was we had had two previous EPs before that, and then three years of being a band before that. So, you know, we've been a band for a long time, and I think a lot of, like, the developmental stage you're talking about, as far as 
being fresh and just you know figuring out what you want to do and who you are we did before we ever even made a record during the guns N' roses tour yeah perhaps a little bit because i think people a lot of people wanted, wanted to do interviews with us to find out about guns N' roses and our audience grew pretty quickly and the press the circle of people we had working a working relationship with um keeps growing and um, pieces are removed, new pieces are, are added. And with the Guns N' Roses tour, it was a, the circle was really huge, a lot well, larger as far as who wanted to deal with you and who wanted a piece of you. And you don't have any time to develop these relationships or even maintain them or, or, or anything. So uh, that could be a little bit quick. You got half the people you don't even want in your circle. You don't even want to deal with them. They're there. Well, people always want to know about Seattle, but there's a, just like I said, the circle has grown. People that we used to have, you know, a d decent working relationship with, you're, you now have these little shadows around every corner that want to know about Nirvana and Pearl Jam and, and Seattle and Soundgarden and Sub Pop. And um, it's different talking to the Village Voice or the LA Times or some underground magazine like you know your flesh or whatever and then turning around and having to talk to usa today or entertainment tonight or time magazine is you can have exciting great interviews and then you can have interviews where people go away saying a sound garden or a bunch of dicks or or all they would say is yes no or they were hostile it varies just like it you know it's like people you deal with you know in the real world when you first make a record it's pretty impossible to tell um if it's good or not or even what it is or have any idea about it at all but after a few months of, you know away from the studio and you know going back and listening to it and playing the songs it's pretty easy to tell um whether or not it's good or whether or not it's you know something that we can be proud of and we definitely feel proud of it so where are you taking me now well, we're actually through taking you anywhere. We're uh, we've shown you Seattle. Seattle's a nice place. It is. So uh, shut the door when you leave. Um, <laughs> is this goodbye? Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. We're uh, home All now. All right. And, uh, I'll you know, see you later. We'll, we'll call Thank you, you sometime. Bye. Good. Do some laundry. Wipe your feet when you before you. Sorry. It's all right. Soundgarden. 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 Yeah, yeah. Out of your mind, you are. I can't find a way to get back in. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah.